So uh, today in this uh, session of Brain Ponderings podcast, I'm going to talk with Joseph Ledoux. He's the Henry and Lucy Moses Professor of Science at New York University. And he's also the director of the Brain Science Institute, which is, involves collaborations between NYU and investigators at Nathan Klein and the state of New York, I guess, in terms of you, 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 state university. To me. Okay. Um, so Dr. Ledoux has a distinguished career in trying to elucidate what goes on in the brain during emotional behaviors. A lot of his work is focused on rodents doing uh, lesioning studies, for example, damage neurons in a particular brain region to see what effects that has on uh, emotional responses, particularly fear responses, electrophysiology recordings, and so on. Um, he's uh, a member of the National Academy of Sciences, and uh, he was elected a fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences as well as the American Association for the Advancement of Science. So I'm gonna start out, uh, my understanding, Joseph, is that you did not start out as a young man with necessarily an interest in science, but your career evolved uh, semi-serendipitously. Can you, can you talk about that? Sure. I, um, I grew up in a small town in Louisiana, and um, when it was time to go to college, I, um, you know, I, I decided I wanted to go to leave town and go to a larger uh, city rather than live in this small town in Louisiana where, um, uh, where I'd grown up and where there was a junior college opening that the same year. So I went off to LSU and the agreement I had with my parents that I would come, I would study something like business and you know, at some point come back to the, the little town that I lived in and be a banker or something like that. And um, so during college, you know, it was the late 60s and even in Louisiana, by the time I was a, a sophomore, the, the whole you know, anti-war movement and hippie scene had reached uh, even Baton Rouge. And so everybody was you know, becoming more concerned with social issues. And uh, so I, I didn't really want to be in marketing and business anymore, but I didn't see a way out. So I started looking at what, what possibly could be of interest in this field. And what I came up with was consumer psychology. Why do people buy the stuff they do? Um, and started taking courses in psychology to kind of make me more familiar with that whole thing. And in the process, I ended up taking a class with a fellow named Robert Thompson, uh, who had actually studied a bit with Carl Lashley at some point. Um, and Lashley, was, uh, Thompson was a uh, traditional neuroscientist, behavioral neuroscientist, making lesions in the brain. Um, and I, you know, in his class, I learned about that, and I had no idea that you could actually study the brain. Um, and I, you know, kind of was fascinated. I worked in his lab for a while and uh, we published a few papers. And then when I graduated with a master's in marketing by this point, um, I uh, said, well, I think I'd like to go to graduate school. And so I applied to a bunch of places. He wrote me letters. And the only place I got in was Stony Brook because he knew someone there. And there I met uh, Mike Kazaniga, who had worked on split brain patients. And that was good for a couple of reasons. One is that you don't need a lot of science background, have no science courses at all. And as a, a college student, maybe some, you know, very light version of summer physics or something. Um, but in general, I, I had no science training except for the little time I spent in Thompson's lab. But split brain work was good for that because you didn't need to know a lot. I mean, the brain is of these patients, epileptics, uh, or who have problems that can't be treated with up with uh, medications, we'll have this surgery done under rare conditions. And so I don't think it's done that often anymore. But when this is done, the brain is split in half and the seizures seem to be better controlled. But this raises all kinds of interesting questions about, you know, you talk to the left hemisphere, which is verbal, um, but the right hemisphere also can respond to the world. 
uh, but it can't tell you about it. It can find, if you flash a picture of an apple to the right hemisphere, the left hand can reach in a bag and pull the apple out as opposed to the banana or the screwdriver. Um, and so it's, it's a, a kind of conscious sentient uh, organism over there, but it, it can't tell you about it. Um, so we were doing these, these studies in the 1970s. Uh, this was a, a new group of patients. Mike had done the work on the early patients in, in California in the 60s. We were studying this new group of patients up at Dartmouth, and um, we made this observation that when we put information into the right hemisphere and made the right hemisphere respond in a certain way, we would then ask the, the left hemisphere, why did you do that? And the right, the left hemisphere would immediately generate a narration, a, you know, a kind of confabulation to explain its behavior, the behavior of its body. So if, the, if we made the right hemisphere stand up, uh, we'd say, why'd you do that? So I needed to stretch. I was getting kind of tired sitting there. Or if, he, if we made it laugh, he would say, oh, you guys are funny, something like that. So um, what we concluded out of all this was that what the, what, an important function of the human brain and consciousness is to uh, have these narrations, these stories, uh, because the conscious mind isn't privy to all of the many systems in our body that can generate a behavioral output. And so it's, you know, we all believe we have free will as humans and uh, not whether we do or not is you know, a debatable question, I guess, but we all kind of have a sense that we're in charge of what we do. Um, and if, if we aren't in charge and our body is producing behaviors all the time that don't make sense to our conscious mind, that can be disturbing and cause cognitive dissonance. So we need to like have some way to cope with the dissonance that's, that is generated by these non-conscious behaviors. Um, and so that's, um, uh, that was the foundation for the way I began to think about things. And we concluded that this dissonance reduction capacity of the conscious brain um, is perhaps triggered by emotion systems, which would be systems that might generate, you know, we propose that this might be systems that generate behaviors non-consciously. So I said, okay, well, you know, I, I think I was at the bar with Mike one night in, at, up in Vermont, and he said, you know, there's not a lot of work on emotion. The light bulb went off, and I said, okay, that's what I'm going to do. It's kind of what I was doing in Thompson's lab, uh, and I went back to making brain lesions and so forth and started studying Pavlovian fear conditioning uh, because it was a simple way to take a stimulus that had no meaning and convert it into a meaningful stimulus that elicits behavioral and physiological responses. So it seemed that that was a good way to study perhaps unconscious systems that generate behavior. Um, but I always went back to the topic of consciousness and conscious uh, responses. And Con you're studying it in this beast here. Right. Studying it in rats. Yeah. But when, yeah, by the time I was writing review papers and so forth, uh, I was um, thinking about all of this in terms of what it meant for conscious fear. <laughs> Uh, at the time, the, there was this idea that you know memory can be implicit or explicit. So I, I was kind of working in the memory area, and so I adopted this idea of implicit fear being what the amygdala did. By the way, what I should say is that in the process of studying Pavlovian fear conditioning, what we did is we implicated the amygdala as a, a key part of the circuitry that detects and responds uh, to the danger. Uh, and this was done through you know, lesions and track tracing and physiology and all of the, the good stuff that was available at the time. Um, <clears throat> I didn't go for the amygdala necessarily, but because it, you know, it did have a reputation of being involved in, in, uh, in fear, um, I started with the ear and tried to trace the pathways through the brain, just as you know, Kendall was able to do this in invertebrates, I thought, well, maybe we can do this in vertebrates as well if we take a simple behavior like Pavlovian conditioned responses and just give that stimulus, say what parts of the auditory system were involved by making lesions. We found that the auditory cortex wasn't necessary, but the auditory thalamus was. We injected tracer into the thalamus, it went to the amygdala. So when lesioned the amygdala, that disrupted the, the responses. So we connected the input part of the amygdala, which is the lateral nucleus, to the output part, which is the central nucleus. And from there, we could, go, we could trace out the autonomic and somatic uh, pathways. Well, it's a, 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 a fairly direct route from 
from the audit from the sound to the amygdala that doesn't require uh, cognitive processing necessarily. Right, but even even the auditory cortex doesn't necessarily require much cognitive processing because you you know we call uh, that yeah that's that's true yeah. low road and the high road and um, so the low road would be directly to the amygdala and that could produce a, you know the responses the high road would be more uh, sensorily perceptually complicated uh, but so for example the low road was we, we had evidence that it processed like frequency or uh, intensity, but not necessarily complicated aspects of yeah. the auditory stimulus. So if you have a, a real auditory sound, real world auditory sound that has all kinds of perceptual qualities, yeah. you need the cortex to decode that. And then that would go to the, uh, the amygdala. But it, the idea was that the low road was fast. So in the case of vision, so you're walking around and there's a stake at your feet. So the low road detects that and causes you to freeze. The high road also gives you the information, more detailed information, but it also goes to higher cortical areas, which can interpret what it all means. And that's where I thought the emotion was coming. So I called the prefrontal cortex the source of conscious fear and the uh, amygdala the source of implicit or unconscious fear. Right, so an example of the conscious fear would be if you're walking, through inner city at night and someone tells you don't go around that corner because there's some tough looking guys there and you might get mugged. Now that's gonna require you have to think about what they're saying. But but it'll still elicit some somewhat of a fear response. So let's go back to the snake though, because so the snake you you are walking along and you freeze. And then you see that there's a snake consciously, and then you really have the, the, the fear itself. Yeah. So, uh, you know, a lot of, uh, I wrote an article in Scientific American in 1994 that depicted this idea of the snake uh, triggering all of this. And this article was read quite a bit. And um, in it, I talked about how you could have the same response to a curved stick on the ground that caused you to freeze. Sure. And so you, you, you're walking, you're freezing to the stick, and then you consciously are aware that it's a stick and not a snake. And so you just keep walking. But if it was a snake, you were you know, ahead of the game because you didn't step on it and get bitten. But a lot of people started sending me pictures of, of, uh, of sticks that they, were, that they would see on hikes and so forth. It's kind now, of as far as your interest in brain evolution, looking through PubMed and then you know, what you're telling me about the split brain, I think as far as I can tell, the first article you wrote on brain evolution had to do with what might explain, uh, although we still don't know, I guess the, the basis of asymmetry, you know, one, uh, uh, you know, one side of the, the two sides of the brain aren't identical, I guess is what you'd say. Yeah, I mean, so that, you know, the usual idea is you have left brain, right brain. I think it's kind of bogus uh, idea in terms of actually how the brain works. There, is, there are some functions that are separated. Uh, left hemisphere typically has language. Spatial stuff is more typically in the right hemisphere. But in this paper that you, you're talking about, which came out in Brain Behavior and Evolution, uh, like probably in the 1980s or 90s, um, proposed that um, in, in monkeys, for example, both the, the inferior parietal area in uh, both hemispheres involve spatial processing, but in humans, it's only in the right hemisphere. So the idea was that the transition, evolutionary transition from um, uh, monkeys and apes to humans involved some kind of competition for synaptic space um, because when language came in, it needed the multimodal aspects and you know, the fact that this inferior parietal area receives multiple sensory inputs, language needed that kind of multimodal processing. So uh, rather than split it between the two hemispheres, the way it got worked out in the hypothesis was that language went into the left hemisphere and all of the spatial stuff was then you know, sort of offloaded to the right hemisphere. Um, and you know that's as far as that went. It, I don't think that article is 
read very often. Uh, <laughs> it's not something I'm known for. <laughs> yeah, that gets that's kind of intriguing because language is relatively, as far as we know, certainly complex language like we have. Uh, recent in evolution and other brain start like hippocampus for example um, there's a lot of redundancy you can completely remove one hippocampus from a rat and they they seem to function pretty normally in a maze on the other hand if you damage the the it's you know there isn't redundancy like that with the language circuit right I mean, it's, you know, it's true of the amygdala as well. You can take out one and the animal can still, or human can still respond. But it, what, what we found was that if you really kind of look at it in a more subtle way, the, the, the single amygdala in one, in one hemisphere isn't as good as the two together in kind of uh, pulling the stuff off. I guess in the simplest cases it is. So I wonder if, you know, if you really press the hippocampus on more complicated tasks, you might see a difference there as well, but I don't know. Yeah. Uh, pal, before I forget it, so I just wanted to mention to the viewers and listeners that you've written three, no, four books for the general public. First one was The Emotional Brain, then uh, Synaptic Self, then Anxious, and then most recently, uh, the deep history of ourselves, which is where you really get into, well, it focuses on evolution. And um, I want to focus our conversation on, try to keep coming back to evolution. We're going to have to get into the circuits and neurotransmitters and so on. Um, but if, if you could, um, and, and I saw, I watched, actually this morning, I was watching one of your podcast with Lawrence Krauss, which uh, was very nice. And you went into quite a bit of detail, or obviously not as much as your book, but you gave kind of, you're not going backwards, even to single cell organisms and bacteria, the notion that they respond to stimuli and they have avoidance responses and so on. And, uh, but can you kind of describe the conservation of emotions and and I guess at some point you know that if you look at the dictionary definition of emotions I'm not sure it's the exact same as what your definition might be of emotion yeah so um you know going back to the split brain concept that led me into emotion in the first place the idea was that emotions or cognitive interpretations of situations. This was an idea that Mike Zaniga and I came up with on the basis of those split brain studies. And Mike, you know, throughout his career has been um, a proponent of this interpreter, conscious interpreter that defines our conscious experiences. That was what his research continued to be about. So he kind of took the true high road and that took, you know, the low road into the amygdala to try and understand all this stuff. Um, but all, always I came back to this idea of consciousness, uh, conscious fear being a cognitive interpretation. Um, but in my empirical work, I was studying these Pavlovian conditioned responses. And at the same time, uh, you know, there was a lot of work going on in invertebrates through Kandel and, and many others um, that was uh, generating ideas about what molecules might be involved in the plasticity in Pavlovian conditioning. So we're, you know, because it was much easier to, to go into the circuits and study molecules in an invertebrate, they mapped out a lot of the details that, uh, that were relevant. And so we use some of those in uh, studying rats and, you know, and turned out a lot of it was kind of the same, um, same molecules. So the idea was, you know, it's not that the, uh, also in the hippocampus for LTP and so forth, spatial behavior, many of the same molecules, PKA, you know, um, CREB, uh, MAP kinase, all the, the standard things that we think of as being involved in synaptic plasticity, were involved in both hippocampus and amygdala and both in rats and, you know, in invertebrates. So the idea that I had at the time was that 
you know, that the uh, differences, say, between hippocampus and amygdala are, is, is not um, the molecules, but what the molecules are doing, what kind of information they're working with. But anyway, so that with the, the similarity of the molecules made me start thinking about, well, how does, you know, how does uh, an aplysia, you know, kind of invertebrate uh, sea, sea snail and a mammal end up with the same molecules? So I was friendly with a fellow named Seth Grant who had been at Kandel's lab uh, uh, for a while, but I was on sabbatical at Cambridge in 2009 and I was doing a lot of uh, chatting with Seth who had done a lot of genetic analyses of the of synaptic plasticity molecules and especially the NMDA receptor. And what Seth found was that the NMDA receptor has components that are conserved in invertebrates like the aplysia and also in mammals. Um, but he also found that it, it's not just, you know, well, how do, how do we get that, that con conservation? That means that there was probably some common ancestor of the protostomes that lead to the invertebrates and the deutostome invertebrates that lead to uh, vertebrates. So I don't want to spend too much time on that distinction, but it's an embryological distinction that gives rise to two kinds of organisms, the classic invertebrates that we know about, bees and bugs and snails and octopus and so forth. Um, on the one um, hand. So, so a lot of our work over the years is focused on calcium. I started out my early work in developmental neurobiology uh, back in the 80s, and I showed that glutamate, which is the major excitatory transmitter in the brain during brain development, glutamate sculpts the formation of neural networks. And the way it does that is by activating receptors, NMDA receptors, coupled to calcium influx. And calcium is a, it's such an important signal. And one thing it does with related to strengthening synapses is it affects the polymerization state of cell cytoskeleton proteins, actin, microtubules. And so it, when a cell gets a signal, whether it's glutamate in a neuron or some other signal in a bacteria or, or single cell organism, that calcium can change the shape of the cell. In the case of single cell organisms, it affects their movement. In the case of synapses, it may make them bigger. And um, I just thought I'd throw that out. It's calcium is yeah. kind of a, a key. Absolutely. Signaling molecule and all this. Yeah. So, I mean, the, the point is that there was a common ancestor about 630 million years ago that gave rise to these two lines, one to the invertebrates, the common classical neuron invertebrates, and the invertebrates that then led to the vertebrates. Um, and this bilateral ancestor, according to the genetic analyses that Seth was able to construct, reconstruct, had these molecules as well, had these, these NMDA receptor components, or at least some of them. Yeah. But not only that, so did jellyfish, a whole nother phylum down uh, that is, um, uh, you know, that, that is not, it doesn't even have a central nervous system, but more of a radial nervous system. And not only that, the ancestor of jellyfish, uh, the, um, uh, like, uh, was this a sponge-like organism, and it has these molecules, these NMDA components, without even a nervous system. And if you look at the single cell ancestor of sponges, they have these molecules, these NMDA receptor components, yeah. but no nervous system. So if you look at the behavior of, of protozoa, which uh, uh, you know, Herbert Spencer Jennings did in 1901, he found that they approach and avoid danger, just as a mammal will do. And they do that without a nervous system. Yeah. The conclusion that I'm drawing from stepping back from you know, the observation of the, the similarity of the molecules in mammals and invertebrates 
is that there are things that are conserved in evolution that are then used to do things that they weren't doing before. So in other words, in protozoa, the NMDA receptor components are not being used to make um, synapses and to make, and to make synaptic transmission because there's no nervous system. They were used for something else. And one of the key things that seems to be conserved throughout all of this are these structural plastic, structural molecules that hold cells together. Uh, uh, as you go from the transition from, in, from invertebrate, sorry, from protozoa to a single cell, to, sorry, from proto, single cell protozoa to sponges, multicellular organisms, you have to be able to have the, the cells cling together. So that kind of clinging together step that created multicellular organisms was sort of co-opted with the NMDA components that were involved in calcium and all those things to allow neurons to sprout connections and then cling together uh, as a unit into a nervous system. So that was kind of all fascinating to, to learn about. Um, and it, so I'd ask, well, what about if we go further back in evolution? And of course, then you get to bacteria uh, and, and the prokaryotes instead of the eukaryotic protozoa. And even bacteria learn about danger and respond to the danger and move away from bad things. And so I came up with this, ser this set of four or five things that seem to be conserved throughout the entire history of life. Um, <clears throat> one was the detection and response to danger. Another was the uh, incorporation of nutrients from the outside. Another is the balancing of ions, um, electrolytes, and water, uh, and salt, and so salt and water, electrolytes and water, to, so that the cell doesn't collapse or explode. Another is thermoregulation, and another is reproduction. So the idea was that every cell starting with the first cell that ever lived long enough to reproduce and give rise to the rest of the history of life, um, every cell has had to solve those five problems or every organism, including <laughs> organisms like us. So those five problems are, are not, I mean, they can be done behaviorally, can be solved behaviorally, but that's, it's not the behavior that's been conserved over that long history. We didn't inherit freezing behavior from bacteria. What we inherited were um, these survival requirements. And then each organism is gonna implement those survival requirements in accordance with the body plan that its species is evolving to uh, survive in the world. So bacteria will survive in one way. Protozoa have to do it a little differently. They're bigger, they have you know, different body plans. Once you get into to animals, you've got uh, all kinds of different body plans. And if we think about the, uh, just take the, the mammals, some mammals will run away from danger, others will fly away, others will swim away. Um, so it's not what's conserved throughout this is the detection and response to danger. The, the mandatory nature of having some way to detect and respond to danger, to incorporate nutrients so, and so on. But the way the organism the, uh, solves the problem, implements the problem, or implements the solution is a function of the kind of body that it's needing to survive in its environment. So that's kind of how I got into the whole thing. I didn't know any of this uh, evolutionary stuff, uh, but certainly no evolutionary biology. So I had to learn it all to write that book. Now, so avoiding danger is, uh, you know, an obvious survival advantage for that, but also would be um, seeking food, for example, which is sort of a, uh, kind of a positive thing. Are there emotions associated with with seeking food? Well, uh, certainly we, when we seek food, have um, you know we see a picture of a hamburger or you know boiled egg or something, and we're, we haven't eaten in a while. We get our, we begin to salivate and we think about it. We are, you know we kind of crave the food or at least desire it and. When we have it, we enjoy the food. We experience the pleasure of it if it tastes good. We experience the disgust of it if it's putrid. 
Um, but we have to be careful in projecting these experiences that we have onto other animals. I'm certain they probably have some kind of experience, but we, we don't know what they have. A good example is, you know, you see a dog that's been hit by a car and it's lying on the side of the road, it's writhing. And the human mind can't help but project our feelings of empathy and sympathy and everything else onto the dog and assume that it is feeling what we would feel if that were us. And again, it's probably I'm certainly feeling something, but all we're seeing when we see it writhing and, and howling are its reflexes. And you know, the problem that we face so often is that many of the behaviors that we study in animals as proxies of human emotions uh, or even of their emotions are these more kind of neurobiologically predetermined behaviors, for example, habits also fixed action patterns, you know, innate responses and habits that, that we learn that are uh, become routine and processed unconsciously. So those three levels of, of behavioral execution have nothing to do with fear itself. They are just routine responses. It's only when you engage the cognitive and conscious systems of the, of the brain that you then are able to cognitively interpret that it's you that's in danger. You know, I had a, I made a t-shirt that went with the book, Deep History, and it says, no self, no fear. And the basic idea is that if you aren't part of the conscious experience of danger, then it's not an emotion, it's not fear. Because you you, if you're not afraid, you're not afraid. I mean, the, if you, you, have to, you have to be part of the experience. It has to be what Indel Talving called an autonomic conscious state state in which yourself is represented there and that you can mentally time travel to the past in or mentally uh, simulate the future in. Uh, <clears throat> let's take joy and sadness. So anyone who's had pets, uh, for example, growing up, we had dogs. We'd all, we always had two dogs. I grew up on a farm in southern Minnesota. And a couple of times, one of them died. And just anecdotally, it seems obvious that the other one is very sad morning. Um, and then also, you know, playful behaviors and so on, joy. Now, I guess let's talk about functional brain imaging in humans and what's known about, say, when a person experiences a pleasurable, experience or something that would make them sad. So let's kind of put fear, not put fear out of the equation, but ask the question, to what extent is there overlap between the neural networks involved in, in a negative emotion versus a positive emotion? And then what's known in animals about whether similar circuits are involved in those. Uh, we, we, we know in the case of fear, but what about joy and sadness? You know, I, I don't wanna, I don't really, I spent my life studying fear. I'm not an expert on joy and sadness. You may think, oh, that's, that's very narrow. Okay. Um, and there's a lot of, I think, sloppy research, especially interpretation in the whole field of emotion. And I really have focused on one thing where I'm confident of what I'm talking about. And I'm not gonna talk about other things that uh, I don't know that much about. I'm happy to explain what I think is going on in a fearful state. Um, but, you know, I, I, I have pets. I treat them as if they have conscious emotions and that you know, when they're hungry, they, they're howling and when they're, you know, afraid of something that they're, they're acting in that way as well. But, you know, when we're scientists, we have to put on a different hat than when we interpret the behavior of animals. Um, as I said, most of the behaviors we see and, and attribute emotions to other animals with are behaviors that in us don't require any kind of fear or any kind of conscious experience. Uh, that people with amygdala damage can even, um, uh, uh, 
still feel fear. It's not, fear is not something that bubbles up out of some innate circuit. Fear is the cognitive interpretation of a situation. And I think all emotions are like that. I'm not a believer in the idea of basic emotions that are hardwired. There is no basic emotion. All emotions in humans are cognitive interpretations. Um, now, I think we, what we can do is we can ask questions about like, what is it in the human brain um, that, you know, how do, what, circuits in the human brain allow us to have three kinds of conscious experiences. One is autonoetic consciousness, which is self, it involves the self. And I think all emotions are autonoetic conscious states, at least in humans. Um, then we can also ask about semantic consciousness, recognition of objects and their value and so forth. Um, we know that all animals can behaviorally do that. What we don't know is whether all animals or other animals have um, autonoetic consciousness. This has been explored in episodic memory in, in animals, uh, trying to find out if they have mental time travel. And the conclusion is that we can't talk about episodic memory in animals. We can talk about episodic like memories because there's no evidence that's been acquired that is convincing to even the researchers, for example, uh, uh, Nikki Clayton at, at Cambridge and uh, Tony Dickinson, who have done a lot of work on bird episodic memory, they call it episodic like because they agree that there's no way to know if the animal has the ability to mentally time travel. So they might, but we shouldn't make the presumption. You know, a lot of this goes back to Darwin's time in Victorian England um, when he was trying to get his theory of evolution accepted by the general public. And there was a lot of resistance because the public was religious. Uh, and so evolution, the idea that uh, evolution, we, that we evolved and, and you know, uh, continue or have some kind of continuity with other animals. Uh, what, what about the Garden of Eden and the, you know, the um, birth of, of humans uh, being a few thousand years ago? So uh, this was a hard sell uh, to Victorian England. And when he, when he wrote the, uh, yeah, the, uh, his book on emotions in animals and, and man, he um, went down the road of saying that animals have human-like emotions. And he was once questioned about, why do you talk about animals that have, as having human-like emotions, but humans as having animal-like bodies, the continuity in that direction? And he said, well, it's, uh, uh, it's kind of a nicer, more general way to present it to the public. So in sort of trying to get his ideas across by not saying that people are animals, but saying that animals are people, uh, he steered the entire field of emotion research, which took off in the late 19th century and became so anthropomorphic that um, behaviorism was the net result that John Watson and others said, we, you know, we can't go on like this. You can't just say a behavior is, is due to consciousness without any kind of evidence. This was true in human research as well as in animals, but behaviorism resulted and so consciousness got banned. Now, when, the cogn when cognitive science came back, the mind came back, but not the mind that the behaviors got rid of. The reason cognitive science was able to make its way in was that behaviorism was kind of floundering and failing uh, but also the co cognitive science didn't come in by studying consciousness. It came in by studying the mind as information processing that could or could not lead to consciousness, but it didn't matter. It was about the process, something you could study in a computer or in a human. Um, and, but with the sort of the demise of behaviorism over the years, this, the you know, consciousness crept back in both in a good way, now it's studied extensively scientifically in humans, but also in a bad way where there's a lot of, even in humans, but also in animals, there's freewheeling attributions like the Wild West of the late 19th century again. People talk about emotional behaviors and conscious experiences in animals without any evidence. It's just assume that it's correct. And you can't do that. Scientifically, you have to ask, what's the evidence for that? And almost every time someone generates some piece of evidence that they think proves animal consciousness, Someone can debunk it by saying, well, there's an, a non-conscious explanation. Again, it doesn't mean animals don't have states, but scientifically, we have to be strict about what we call conscious and what we call non-conscious states and make the distinction. 
And have you thought a lot about how you might design experiments to answer that kind of question? Or do you think it's not possible to answer? I don't think you can. But what we can do is make empirically based speculations. Yeah. But we have to be clear that we're speculating. The problem often in the field of animal consciousness is that the assumption that you go into the, the experiment with the assumption that it's correct. Um, and you know this, and when you challenge those assumptions, you're considered you know an, a, a denier of some kind. You know so there are some scientists that that use the word denier for people who question whether they the, the experiment has demonstrated animal consciousness. Denier has all kinds of negative implications and has no place in the uh, scientific discourse. Um, but the thing with consciousness. Consciousness, I think the key thing is just to first define it. And my personal definition of consciousness is a simple one. It's the awareness of incoming sensory input or internally generated thoughts. And, you know, so you, if, if I define it that way, then it makes it easy to answer. I think if you go on the internet and you see all these people talking about consciousness and they never define it. If you can't, if you don't have a definition of something, how do you study it? Well, there are definitions. And the first definition you have to uh, rule out, and this often gets, uh, becomes confusing because it's not ruled out, is that there's creature consciousness. There's just the ability to detect and respond to danger and to cycle through sleep and wakefulness. So people who are in coma don't have that. But that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about the mental state consciousness, which is a second kind. And mental state consciousness, I think that's what you defined in your, your, um, in your definition, but I'm not sure because it wasn't clear from exactly what you said, whether you really meant yeah. the um, uh, ability to have an internal representation that, that is a kind of re-representation of pure sensory information, or whether you just mean any kind of sensory processing that leads to behavior. Um, and so there, there are gradations of mental state consciousness that I think help make the distinction much clearer than what you talked about. One is something called autonoetic consciousness, which we already talked about, which is the ability for you to be the subject of the, uh, and the agent of the experience. Um, then there's noetic consciousness, which is the uh, knowledge of factual knowledge or conceptual knowledge about what something is and what it does and what its value is and so forth. So autonoetic consciousness is very difficult, almost impossible, as we talked about in terms of uh, episodic memory, to implicate in animals. But we... we uh, in terms of noetic, again, we don't know what an animal has, but we know that the brain areas involved in noetic consciousness, for example, you know, sensory areas being re-represented in uh, granular prefrontal cortex that um, are creating complex internal representations of what a stimulus is and getting inputs from subcortical areas about the uh, value of that stimulus to you at the moment those kind of integrations are, are able to take us to the finish line of consciousness in an animal without necessarily having to cross it uh, because we don't know if they cross it. But we can, if we understand the neural circuits underlying noetic consciousness in the human brain, which we have some pretty good evidence for, we can say, well, if those circuits exist in other mammals, especially other primates, then they could have that kind of consciousness that we have, whether they do or not, we don't know, but they could have that kind. Yeah. And then there's a third kind of consciousness called anoetic, which is um, a more kind of fringe consciousness. It's about body states and uh, uh, statistical regularities that give you the feeling of ownership of the more cognitive kinds of consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, without you having to ever acknowledge that. I mean, if, if someone says, is that mental state yours or is that body movement yours? You say, yeah, of course, yeah. But you knew that without explicitly like, acknowledging it. 
because it's on the fringe of your consciousness. It's there waiting to be accessed if necessary. It yeah. gives you that feeling that your states are, are right or comfortable or yours. Um, this feeling of knowing, tip of the tongue, all these things come out of this, this fringe area. Um, and the areas of the brain involved in all of that stuff involve, you know, like default network uh, areas, uh, you know, parietal cortex, hippocampus, uh, medial prefrontal cortex, all structures that are shared across all mammals. So all mammals have the neural network necessary for anoetic consciousness. Primates at least have the neural networks necessary for noetic consciousness. There's probably a state between noetic and anoetic that is a kind of um, uh, a simpler version of what can be constructed without, for example, dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and other parts of granular prefrontal cortex and lower mammals, but still has semantic factual content. So, um, you know, I guess there are four kinds. There's pure anoetic, there's pure noetic, something in between those two, and then uh, autonoetic. So that's how I view it. And so I'm willing to extrapolate to other animals uh, uh, on the basis of what we know about the human brain and consciousness. If the other animals have those circuits, they might have that kind of consciousness in us. In an article I just uh, published in Philosophical Transactions of the Royal Society, in a special issue on behavioral evolution, um, I also push this distinction to uh, beyond mammals to other vertebrates because of uh, one of the reviewers suggestion. Um, so we know that all of the, the primitive areas of the human brain, the basic areas of the, the human brain, the mammalian brain have some representation. Of, let's, let's say all areas of the mammal brain have some kind of precursor, some homologue in fish and other vertebrates. So early fish with a kind of, you know, primitive homologue of, of, uh, of cortex might be able to re-represent internal states in such a way as to have a kind of very, very raw anoetic consciousness, or at least it has the, the, the ability to take you all the way to the threshold of anoetic consciousness that we have. We cross it, but we don't know if the other organisms cross it. But at least that gives us an empirical basis for speculating. And it, I'm, I'm very clear that I'm speculating. I'm not saying this must be yeah. the case. Yeah. I'm not saying any of this must be. Even in, in human research, we have you know, debates about what consciousness is. Um, but I I'm, I'm, was recently elected to be the president of the, the Association for the Scientific Study of Consciousness, which I'm very uh, pleased about. Um, even though I don't do human research, I've got a long history of consciousness uh, research in me. And so um, I was elected for that spot. Let's, um, you know, based on your work and others, there's a huge literature on the amygdala, uh, fear conditioning. What about the prefrontal cortex? I'm going to have uh, Michael Platt as a guest. And I've been particularly interested in the notion from brain evolution perspective that food scarcity was the major driving force for brain evolution in general, including human brain evolution. For example, all the early tools invented by humans had to do with acquiring or processing food. Over the years, we've done a lot of work and I, actually in the lay public, that's what I'm best known for our work on effects of fasting on the brain, intermittent fasting. And the prefrontal cortex is important in decision-making. And of course, uh, I, I guess we're often advised not to make important decisions when we're in emotional states. Uh, so I guess, could you first talk about the, the roles of prefrontal cortex? and emotional behaviors, and then how that, I'm not gonna talk about this with Mike, Michael Platt, about um, decision-making, you know, the, the impact of emotions on decision-making, if, if, if you have something to say about that. Well, first, I think, you know, I, I agree with you about the role of, uh, of energy management in uh, evolution. Um, 
I've been, I'm working on a new book and a big role is played by, in, in the thesis that I'm developing is played by foraging um, as a driving force in, in all of cognitive and uh, conscious evolution. So I, I'm with you there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, the, uh, when, one thing I discovered was that I hadn't thought about was that the fact that endothermy is um, a, uh, a feature in birds and, and mammals, obviously, um, but that it might have um, been the basis for the mental modeling abilities that, that both mammals and birds ended up having, the ability to create complex representations and to make decisions. Um, uh, obviously, it's a you know, parallel evolution rather than uh, any kind of uh, common ancestor that, that is involved in that. But I thought that was fascinating that endothermy was uh, possibly a, uh, a source of, um, of, of cognitive evolution. Um, so I'm, you know, there, there are like different camps on what prefrontal cortex means and so forth. And um, I'm not sure where you stand on all of that, but um, I, I'm in the, on the side of um, that, that mammals, lower mammals don't have a granular prefrontal cortex in areas like the uh, dorsal lateral, ventral lateral and lateral orbital and the, the frontal, lateral frontal pole, lateral medial frontal pole uh, are novel add-ons uh, in, in primates. Um, I follow uh, uh, Preuss and, and Wise on this, Steve Wise and uh, Todd Preuss, um, the, uh, and Richard Essingham. Um, yeah. I, um, so so, somewhere on the shelf, I have their book on the prefrontal cortex is, uh, Really, a tour de force. Uh, Passingham's. Uh, Passingham and Wise's book on the prefrontal cortex. That, that's it's quite old, but it's it, even then it was really a, kind of a tour de force. Passingham has a new one, but uh, yeah. The, anyway, so um, you know the when we're talking about prefrontal cortex, we have to distinguish what rats have. And they have all those medial prefrontal areas that are involved in goal-directed behavior. Uh, they're able to create a mental model and uh, hold information in mind, make decisions about it, you know, where to forage, where not to, what, you know, what time of day to go, um, what, uh, you know, what to look for given what they need and so forth. And of course, you know, that those abilities become more complex and, and uh, sophisticated in primates um, with the advanced development of the, the, the um, granular prefrontal cortex, uh, which is you know, more sophisticated, not just because it's, you know, a new piece of the brain, but because of its complex interconnectivity with the back parts of the brain, uh, it receives primarily inputs from multimodal areas uh, rather than unimodal areas. You get some unimodal, but most of it is multimodal from memory areas and, and multimodal integration areas. So what the granular prefrontal cortex is getting highly processed integrated information and making it even more integrated. So that allows you to, not only, when you see something to know not only what it is, but what it isn't, what it looks like, tastes like, smells like, feels like, all of the, uh, all of the properties can be put into one percept uh, with, with that kind of integration. So when we talk about decision-making, there's the cognitive aspects of it and you know, the, the what, uh, what is it and how, uh, uh, what do I know about it and all of that. But also there's the, um, the value of it that is coming more from, you know, you've got, uh, body state information about your metabolic uh, condition at the moment, how, you know, how deprived of food are you? Uh, signals are going into your brain all the time about that. Uh, those end up in areas like the insula cortex, the, the uh, ventromedial prefrontal cortex and the amygdala. Those calculate the value of what's there in relation to past values that that same object had uh, previously had. And all of that is put into kind of a, a, you know, in a rat, a working memory representation, free limbic cortex of uh, what 
you know, what, what is going on and how you might respond to that. Uh, and then this gets much, as, you know, as I said, if you've got a, a dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, you can do all that integration much more successfully. But we still have all the, the stuff that, that rat ha rats have in terms of the medial areas that are integrating the body state information, homeostatic need information, uh, along with the memories of past values into the mental model that then is more sophisticated than a rat can do with prelimbic because the prefrontal, the lateral prefrontal and, and frontal pole are the most conceptual parts of the brain of, of any animal. Yeah. Yeah, there's, there's mental maps and calendars in the, you know, in the synaptic connections somewhere. And they can be pulled out as needed. So when an animal, say hunter gatherers, for example, uh, so the men hunt. So they they go out often fairly long distances, looking for game animals that they usually hunt together. And it's advantageous for them to remember where certain animals were, were what time of day they're there, what time of year they're there. And then the same with with foraging for whatever nuts, fruits, having a, a mental map and calendar uh, on board and being able to draw upon it in real time is, uh, I, I mean, that, that's, that was the, the life. That's the life of animals in the wild, including our human ancestors. I, one thing I've been concerned about is that you probably know this, there's only a couple studies, but showing that are uh, providing evidence that the overall brain size of humans has gotten somewhat smaller since before the agricultural revolution. And that's based on cranial volumes. And not, nowadays, we're very specialized in what we do, each individual. And we're very, certainly, the networks have been repurposed for specific tasks. But we're generally specialists and not generalists. And it's, it's, it's too bad we, we can't do MRI on someone that was right. 10,000 years old. Well, we can't. So we don't know for sure. Uh, it could be this, since we're not moving as much, maybe it has a lot to do with sensory motor aspects of the cortex are reduced. And maybe there's no reduction or even an, increase in size in say prefrontal cortex or i think that there is evidence that prefrontal is larger than uh, expected for other primates i mean steve weiss uh, oh, oh i know but but um uh, modern day humans versus humans twelve thousand years ago there right we don't know that absolutely right, right. uh let's go back let's get back to the, the evolution of emotions um, let's see. Yeah, one aspect to this, which maybe most general people are aware of, is when when you're in a fearful situation, anxiety provoking situation, you there's a rush of adrenaline, epinephrine. There's increased release of cortisol from your adrenal glands. And a lot of that has to do with getting energy to muscles and the heart and the heart pumping stronger and so on. But those, those hormones, they're also neurochemicals and they go to the brain. And evolutionarily, most, animals are exposed to a, a fearful situation only transiently, uh, our stressful situation transiently, although it depends. I mean, there's, I guess, some non-human primate societies, there's a, a <laughs> dominance, you know, rank order dominance and the subordinates. Apparently, Robert Sapolsky's work, for example, have higher uh, cortisol levels 
suggesting they're under more chronic stress. But nevertheless, um, what's known about, do these peripheral hormones affect emotions, uh, both in a, in a, a, a normal physiological, non-pathological setting? And then why don't you talk about that and then we can move on to talking about chronic anxiety, depression, which is often presaged by chronic anxiety. And okay, so let, let's start with the, the hormone, how circulating factors may affect emotions. Could I um, start with the work backwards into that? Sure. So in a situation of danger, the stimulus comes into the brain, um, enters the sensory system, goes to uh, uh, the amygdala from the thalamus, goes to the amygdala from the cortex, and then goes to prefrontal cortex and so forth. Now, when the amygdala is activated, it will drive um, the uh, parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system to release epinephrine uh, from the uh, adrenal uh, medulla. Um, the, it will also trigger the release of, of um, uh, cortisol through the um, hypothalamus and then the, the whole adrenal cortical, you know, the whole axis from the pituitary gland to the adrenal cortex. So epinephrine and cortisol are released into the circulation. And of course, as you, as you said, they go to the brain. Epinephrine cannot enter the brain directly. It has to enter through some other channel. Cortisol does enter and sort of floods all of the, the four brain areas that, that we care about and have been talking about, hippocampus, amygdala, so forth, prefrontal cortex. Um, but epinephrine and norepinephrine don't cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, so in order to impact the brain, they bind to um, receptors on the vagus nerve and are then transmitted into, the, the, that leads to neural transmission into the brainstem, uh, which in by a second synapse goes to locus ceruleus and causes uh, brain arousal uh, in, in, in the brain. So that, that's very interesting. So act, the brain activates the sympathetic nervous system, and then the sympathetic nervous system affects the brain through the parasympathetic nervous system. Well, through the vagus. I mean, well, really. that's but that's parasympathetic, right? No, no, but they're yeah. they're yeah. It's the it's the afferent rather than the efferent. Sure, sure. We, you know, we, we've done some work on Parkinson's disease, and there's this story now where the pathology begins in the gut. And then it's it's transmitted retrogradely through the vagus nerve into the brain, and um, yeah, it, it's really interesting the, how the vagus nerve seems to convey things retrogradely into the brain. Uh, so anyway, I, actually, I didn't know this, Joseph. What you said about uh, epinephrine and norepinephrine getting into the brain through the vagus nerve—that's new to me, so I, uh, I'm, I'm glad you said that because I'm going to look into this. I'm interested in it. I, I haven't looked at this in a while, so I hope my knowledge is still current but <laughs> okay. and thought about for a while. Anyway, so the once the locus ceruleus is activated, that leads to widespread, you know, arousal in cortex and some areas and so forth. Neurons become more active and inputs that are active during the release of norepinephrine onto their, onto their dendrites are going to be more likely to process information and so on and so forth. At least that's the, the traditional story. I don't know if there are updates to that. Um, so we've got a brain now that is activated by way of the periphery in a sense, but also indirectly, I'm sorry, more directly, the amygdala activates the locus ceruleus directly. Uh, but also through the body. So you got two converging uh, inputs to keep the locus ceruleus going in a uh, kind of a roused state. Um, the cortisol, of course, is circulating and uh, will bind to receptors on the surface of the cell, but also 
inside of the nucleus. And that will affect the ability, for example, of the hippocampus to store memories and so on and so forth. But what I wanna shift to is now the uh, prefrontal cortex. Um, so for, in my theory, the conscious experience of an emotion and the conscious experience of a non-emotional situation uh, involve the same general kind of network. That's one kind of cognitive network that generates all conscious experiences. And what's different about an emotional and a non-emotional situation is the other things going on in the brain. In other words, in an emotional situation, there's a lot more going on in terms of all this physiology and uh, other things happening that is gonna provide additional inputs into working memory mental models. Yeah. Um, and what distinguishes this emotion from that emotion is also the kind of inputs that are coming into the brain and facilitating and acting on the working memory mental model or contributing to the mental model. So the, the mental model that you construct is both dictated by the situation um, but also becomes sort of in charge of the experience that you're gonna have. Um, so that, you know, a lot of my theorizing about emotion goes back again to the split brain work where we were greatly influenced by Leon Festinger's theory of cognitive dissonance and Stanley Schachter and Jerome Singer's theory of um, uh, emotional cognition where, that emotion is a cognitive interpretation of the situation in which you find yourself. And so that's where I've been locked in for all these decades and building, constructing this, this model where we have much more knowledge now about what the, how the cognitive system works, how working memory works and what, it, what it's really doing with all of this stuff uh, and can construct these mental models based on all of the other things happening in the brain. So in, in, in a dangerous situation, your mental model will include not only information about the situation, but also information that, that you've stored over the course of your life about fear and danger in an emotion schema. Yeah. So the core thing that brings all of the stuff together, I think is the ventromedial prefrontal cortex, which represents schema by drawing information from long-term memory and autobiographical memory and so forth. So that you have now a fear schema that's activated and that can be shared through connections between ventromedial prefrontal cortex and lateral prefrontal cortex in the middle model. So that provides you a conceptual template in which to interpret the situation you're in. Yes. Yeah. That biases you to automatically be in the fear mode. Uh, and when you confirm that there's, you know, semantically that there's something dangerous there. You've completed the, the uh, you know, the puzzle in a sense uh, that that the conceptual schema has provided you with. So for me, uh, fear is not a universal emotion. What's universal is danger, and all cultures have a word for danger and experiences that people have when they're in danger. Um, but we know from cult cross cultural research that emotions are experienced differently in different cultures. So what you experience in your culture is determined by two factors. One, the cultural understanding of that emotion and two, your personal experiences with that emotion. So only you can have your fear and only people in your culture can have the fear that your culture allows. So the idea is that emotions are very personal within the umbrella of the culture in which you're in. You know, we can translate fear, the word fear across cultures. And we assume that when we do that, it means that everybody is experiencing the same thing, but that's simply not the case. Um, emotions are, are culturally specified. There's certainly a lot of overlap, but it's not exactly the same thing. And just as my fear is dictated by my schema and all of the experiences I've had and yours is by yours. So it's all personal. Yeah. To be that personal, you have to have this kind of episodic autonoidic awareness uh, that's part of the experience. Yeah, that makes makes a lot of sense to me. I, I was just thinking as you were talking, you know, 
So the importance of, re of remembering fearful situations or emotional situations in general for survival and reproduction. Now, it, have studies been done, has the following experiment done, been done? It probably has done this, not up on this. Bilateral lesion of the hippocampus and fear conditioning, what happens? Uh, nothing unless it's context conditioning. So if you if you don't if there's no tone, you just condition the animal to the context, and the hippocampus is required. Um, but if you lesion, if you're talking about the entire hippocampus, the ventral hippocampus does seem to have a role. Um, and I'm not sure I, I haven't seen much on that lately, but there there is a literature on the ventral hippocampus. Uh, and, and its its contribution to Pavlovian conditioning. You know, there there are other areas that are popping up more as more research gets done. It's always the case; things become more complicated rather than simpler. And there are uh, certainly strong connections of all three of those brain regions: hippocampus, amygdala, and prefrontal cortex. So let's let's move on to uh, anxiety disorders and. Which is a big problem that's increasing in this country, anxiety yeah. disorders, depression. Um, of course, early drugs used for anxiety disorders were GABA receptor agonists like Valium, diazepam. And so one thing that I, I think a lot of neuroscientists forget this in their work, even, even neuroscientists forget that, that 90, more than 90% 90 approximately of the neurons in the brain, maybe more, are glutamatergic. And they're distributed all over, in all brain regions. The most, next most prominent neurotransmitter is GABA. And dopamine, serotonin, norepinephrine, acetylcholine, <laughs> the, those neurons are relatively few in number and localized to discrete brain regions. And so the only way any neurotransmitter other than affects behavior is by modifying the activity of glutamatergic circuits. And this goes back to you know your, your work and thinking on glutamate receptors and uh, brain evolution going way back even to before there were brains. Um, so one, one drug that affects glutamate at the NMDA receptor that's receiving some attention over the last number of years is ketamine. And there is some work, well, there, there definitely, there's multiple studies in depression. Um, I don't know, are, are there studies with anxiety disorders? So could you kind of talk about yeah, I'm not uh, really up on the ketamine thing. I, I, from what I've read, it seems very promising, but I don't have a lot of uh, you know, empirical uh, facts on hand to, to really say. The, kind of the thing, the, the, the big problem is because glutamate is so important, <clears throat> drugs that, that modify glutamate receptors have major side effects, and, and ketamine has some side effects. And so the drugs that are used to treat anxiety, the benzodiazepines, uh, they have major side effects. You, you know, you're sleepy, you can't concentrate well. Yeah, you're less anxious, but you're going to be less productive. So it seems to me that there's a, I'm not exactly sure how to, I'm not a drug developer, or, you know, how do you go about this? But ideally, you want to specifically, uh, say fear, anxiety, excessive fear, anxiety. You want to specifically modify, say the uh, the glutamatergic neurons in the amygdala, in, in a, actually a certain part of the amygdala. Um, are you doing any work with optogenetics? Can you talk about that then? Because that that's one way to. And the, at the animal level, you can get at this through them with kind of elegant techniques. So, you know, I'm going to have to leave in a few minutes. Okay. <laughs>
but let me let me just point out a couple of things about drug development. The whole history of drug development is based on the assumption that if you make a rat or a mouse less timid behaviorally, it must be less fearful or anxious, and therefore people should become less fearful or anxious. But that whole process has uh, been so unsuccessful that the drug companies are getting out of the business. You mentioned benzodiazepines, but benzos are, are yes, they make you less anxious, but it's because it's primarily because it's a sedative. Uh, it's a gen, it's a general emotional blunting. It's not finding the anxiety center of the brain and turning that off. Uh, and going to the amygdala is not the answer because that will help you with behavioral and physiological symptoms, but not with the subjective symptom. The reason people go to therapists and seek help is because they feel bad. They uh -huh. want to feel better. Yeah. And make them feel better you have to get into the subjective component of that yeah. you have to turn down the you know the high you know the, the volume on the thing with other with medications or cbt or something get the blood pressure down heart rate down this release of hormones down but ultimately you've got to help the person feel better subjectively and we just published a paper called putting the mental back into mental disorders because if you look at the whole history it's not about mental disorders you know Psychiatry went, tr tried to flee from Freud's influence by shutting down the whole idea that mental was important. But they threw the baby without, out with the bath, without, you know, they threw the baby out with the bathwater because you know, they didn't want to be Freudian, which was all about the unconscious, but they threw even the conscious mental part out. Um, and so we were stuck in a, a rut of using metrics, behavioral metrics, things that you can check off on a list and diagnose people that way and get insurance payments that way. But it's not what people need to feel better. Yeah. They need to be able to have their subjective experiences uh, reshaped, retuned in a sense. Uh, and I think, you know, regular old talk therapy is the way to do that. But first you've got to have, uh, you got to tame the amygdala, tame the hippocampus, tame the amygdala to reduce the arousal, tame the hippocampus to reshape the memories, and then you reassess your life. Uh, every therapist does those things, but not in that sequence. I think the sequence is uh, probably very important. Now, ketamine, I think, has it, it's interesting to me because it's something that is starting from the human side rather than trying to build up from the animal side, which I think is never going to really be the answer. Um, but we, there's no center, there's no anxiety center that we can target. We yeah, have to yeah. target prefrontal cortex, and then you're going to change everything the prefrontal cortex yeah. does. Yeah. So I think, you know, maybe, maybe ketamine is useful as a kind of, you know, as it's been described as a kind of reshaping of perspective that allows you now to go into therapy in a, in a more productive way. Yeah, one, so one thing that, um, a lot of anti-anxiety physiologic, like exercise, for example. Exercise, and, and, and most people, I would say, has a, uh, can have a pretty strong anti-anxiety, anti-depressant effect. It, it boosts, we didn't talk about BDNF yet, which it's actually a very important neurotrophic factor that's produced uh, in an activity-dependent manner in glutamatergic neurons. And, others and it's critical for a lot of things we talked about plasticity learning and memory and um there's strong evidence that bdnf mediates the anti-anxiety antidepressant effects of exercise but also of the most commonly prescribed antidepressants the serotonin norepinephrine reuptake inhibitors uh, and so, I don't know, I'm just kind of freewheeling here, but it'd be interesting to look at the effect of cognitive behavioral therapy on BDNF levels. Uh, that could actually be done. You do a spinal tap, take cerebral spinal fluid. Of course, you got to get the volunteers to agree to that, but you'd be surprised. Uh, you know, I'd, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Doctors well, that may, may be another inroad to these anxiety disorders is uh, manipulating this neurotrophic factor uh, 
and through various um, physiological routes. So okay, we, we didn't get to talk about the amygdaloids. I, I watch a couple of videos on YouTube and listen to a few of your songs. And it's one of my questions before I'd listened to, to your, your group was, has your research uh, affected your songwriting? And the answer is a resounding yes. <laughs> You're right. I mean, the, the, <clears throat> the titles and, and words in a lot of your songs have to do with fear and anxiety. So I'd encourage listeners to, uh, or yeah, listeners and viewers to, to listen to some of that. I like that kind of music. I'm a well, I'm a '60s and '70s rock guy because that's what I grew. That's what I grew up with, similar to you, I guess. Uh, but I'll I'll let you go, Joseph. I enjoyed talking to you, um, and you know I wish our careers would have crossed paths earlier because I think uh, there could have been some some common convergence points in, in the kinds of things we've done in our careers. It's not too late. Here we are, we've met. Yep. Okay. Thank nice. you. Bye. In our next uh, three podcasts, we're gonna focus on other aspects of brain evolution. The next one will be with um, Kay Holkamp, who has done a lot of research in spotted hyenas in Africa. And her work has provided a lot of insight into the evolution of uh, the intellect and sociality, sociality. We're also going to have um, uh, Nikki uh, Nikki Clayton from Cambridge University, who's going to talk about her fascinating work in crows uh, and birds in the crow family, and showing how they can use tools and how they can uh, think about the behavior of other birds in relation to storing, hiding food, and how this relates to the evolution of our brains. She's done some work, for example, in children, uh, kind of comparing and contrasting the tool using abilities of children and uh, crow family members. And then I'm going to have a podcast with Michael Platt, who I mentioned in during this pod, podcast and his fascinating work on primate brain evolution, focusing on the prefrontal cortex and its important role in decision making and how that can be maybe influence or inform decision making of the, the average day person. Okay, so that's the first podcast, and thank you for listening.